Today on Monkey Life, Bruce the Loris is in hospital for a checkup. Our plan is to take a, a larger biopsy and then get the pathologist to have a look at the deeper structure of the gland. The team make a tough decision about the future of Capuchin Tau. Yeah, I'd like exactly. to fix Tau, but I accept that we're not going to be able to reverse anything ever. And there's something lurking in the undergrowth at the chimp enclosures. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. Hello, missus. Hi, you. Are you a good girl? The park provides a home for more than 250 monkeys and apes from 22 different species. It's been just over a month since Bruce the Loris was checked out by the vet after the team spotted a large lump on the side of his face. John Lewis examined Bruce under anaesthetic and took samples to be tested at the laboratory. He also put the Loris on a course of antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. Now, five weeks later, he's back to check if Bruce has recovered. From the samples we took last time, there's no suggestion that it's a tumour, there's no suggestion that it's an infection, an abscess. There's no real evidence it's anything we recognise, it's just a large salivary gland. Um, the keepers tell me that he's eating normally, behaving normally, not bothered by it. So at the moment our plan is to take a, a, a larger biopsy. Uh, and by that, I don't mean a huge one. It's still a small biopsy, and then get the pathologist to have a look at the deeper structure of the gland. It means John will need to take another good look at the lump. Loris might be slow moving, but they have a strong grip and a toxic bite. Jeremy, however, manages to catch Bruce in his bedroom so John can inject him with an anaesthetic. Once at the hospital, John waits a few minutes for the drug to take effect. As soon as Bruce is fully under, he begins a close examination, and it's immediately obvious to him that things have improved. Well, that's nowhere near four. That's three. Yeah, pretty well, Jack. This has gone down quite considerably. Probably three by three. Originally, the lump measured four centimetres in diameter. It's decreased in size. For me, it feels softer, you want to give it smaller. A he checks inside Bruce's mouth to see if the lump has been discharging through the salivary gland. Now, if I'm squeezing that, I can't see anything coming through the gland. Once again, John takes samples to send off for analysis, and the team take the chance to weigh Bruce. Box. OK, on to the scale quick. One quick on the scale, please. 1.36. He's lost 40 grams or about 3% of his body mass. But it's nothing for the team or John to be concerned about. In fact, they were hoping he'd lose a bit of weight. It's quite nice that whatever the lump is, even though we're not completely sure what it is at the moment still, it's actually reducing, so it's going in the right direction. No, no, Hello, he's waking no, no, up, no. almost awake. We're making progress just on anti-inflammatory drugs. So rather than take a biopsy from deep in the gland, which involves cutting a hole in the skin and raises the potential for the gland to get infected following surgery, we're just going to carry on giving anti-inflammatories and hope that the progress he's made continues. It's still a bit of a mystery, but Bruce's condition is improving and the Relief team will continue to monitor him over the next few weeks. It's a typical morning at the park as Hananya's group of 18 chimps head outside. Or is it? What the group don't know is there's something sinister lurking in the undergrowth. It appears a snake has hidden away in the grassy enclosure, seemingly ready to strike at unsuspecting passing primates.
Totally unaware, Shamak strolls by, ready for breakfast. He suddenly catches sight of the huge python hidden amongst the brows and hastily beats a retreat. His next reaction is to head up high for a safer vantage point before alerting the rest of the group to the danger. In a matter of seconds, the majority of the troop have joined him and started alarm calling, warning everyone of the potential threat. Their reaction mirrors the behavior of chimps in the wild. Some may have seen snakes when they were in their natural habitat, before being poached from the wild and sold into the black market wildlife trade. That would make them aware of the dangers. Others will have never seen the slithery predators. But instinctively, the group come together to protect both their territory and youngster Thelma, and to offer each other reassurance. Jess is the first to venture close, arming herself with a piece of browse to scare the snake off. But she soon loses her nerve. Hananya, in his alpha male style, isn't getting too close to the snake. He's quite happy encouraging female Trudy to go and investigate. In the past, Hananya's not been the bravest individual in those kind of situations, so we expected him to be pretty concerned about the whole event, and, and certainly he was kind of fear grinning and looking for reassurance from the other individuals and kind of pushing some of his females forward to, to deal with it. Trudy approaches the snake cautiously, with the help of Kiki and the cargo net above, keeping the reptile at bay with a long piece of browse. But it's yet another female, 29-year-old Peggy, who plucks up the courage to tackle the snake. There's no messing with this lady. Once she's worked out the snake isn't moving, she goes in for the kill, straight for the throat, before nonchalantly discarding it. She is an animal that generally will avoid conflict and is pretty laid back, but when she needs to step up, she, she usually doesn't disappoint. So she's certainly an animal that, that we had our eye on and, um, yeah, she was pretty fierce. It's been a great exercise in demonstrating what a strong and united group Hananya's chimps are. Certainly the chimps were, were feeding off each other and, and if one individual reacted, you would get kind of a chain effect when others would join in. Really good to see that group, actually. They all got involved and were reassuring each other and, you know, the priority was to protect the youngster in the group and just reassures us, really, that they do identify as, as a community um, and they do come together when they need to. Hanania's group are relatively young and the team are interested in how an older and more experienced group will react when confronted with danger in their midst. So, next to get a replica reptile invasion, a Paddy's old group, which still has five of the original nine chimps to first arrive at the park. Bixer searches through the brows, unaware at first that anything is amiss. When she does realize, she's unsure and takes a moment to think about it. but then issues an alarm call to the rest of the group. They immediately come together. But the reaction of this group is a lot less frenzied and dramatic than Hananya's. A sign, perhaps, that they're somewhat older and wiser. Mickey is the first to give the snake a poke with a bit of browse. Buster ventures down for a closer look but decides safety in numbers is best, and rejoins Cindy, Mickey and Bart. Together they can present a formidable and intimidating unit to ward off the danger. Mickey decides to take matters into his own hands and moves the snake, testing out its reaction. Bart is an interested observer. The youngest in the group, he hasn't seen anything like this before. Instinct keeps him cautious, as Buster drags the python using a piece of browse. The rest of the group keep out of harm's way, leaving it to the high rankers to cope with the danger. 
They're really, really clever, this group, and actually uh, for a long time didn't make any contact with the snake directly. They were using the tools of the browse, and I guess they're investigating at arm's length, really, to keep themselves safe. Um, so they were cautious in their approach. Actually, even when they moved the snake, um, none of the individuals actually touched the snake, which was interesting and very different um, from what we saw in Hananya's group. It doesn't take long for Paddy's old troop to decide the snake poses no threat, and they're soon more concerned with breakfast. I think there's some things that came out of the exercise with both communities. They were all alerted to the fact that there was something to be worried about in their enclosure, so that was really good to see. Uh, there was an instinct to protect the more vulnerable members of the group, so in Hanania's troop's case, that was the youngster Thalma. And, you know, in the wild, they'd probably have the ability to move on, but if they were in a large fruiting area and they wanted to stay in that vicinity, they would obviously need to deal with the intruder in order to be able to stay there. And I think that's the tactic that they've both taken. It's been a great exercise in seeing how these captive groups of chimpanzees come together as one to protect their territory and community, just like they would in the wild. It's been two weeks since the park welcomed two new rare primates, white-throated Gwenons, Benny and Nia. Since Alison rescued them from Lebanon, they've been kept indoors in their newly refurbished house, giving the primate care team the chance to closely monitor them before letting the pair outside. Yesterday, they met their new housemates, the odd couple, Patas monkey Mitsa and aging ring-tailed lemur George. And today, all four will get to test out their exciting new enclosure, complete with ramps, ropes, trees and high platforms. It's a really big day for Benny and Nia, as this will probably be their first time outside since they were stolen from the wild forests of Benin. Quite exciting. Also a little bit scary and nervous for us lot to make sure that everything's OK in the enclosure, nobody's going to get out and escape. Um, but the introductions yesterday went really, really well with the, the foursome. It was nice and calm and quiet for pretty much the whole day. We did decide to separate them overnight just to give everybody a break before this big day ahead of them. So we've popped them back together inside this morning and now we're just doing our final checks on the enclosure, making sure everything's nice and safe before we open the doors and let them out. Everything is ready and the slides to the outside are opened. Not surprisingly, female Nia is the first of the group to take a look. She's the more confident of the two Gwenons, and while Benny hangs back, she cautiously makes her way down the ramp. It doesn't take long before she's bolting off as far as she can go to the other side of the enclosure. Mita is happy to watch on. Unlike Nia, she's in no hurry and will take her time. She's familiar with ramps and slides and soon finds a nice sunny spot to sit and contemplate her new surroundings. After a few minutes of building up his courage, Benny joins the party, heading straight over to Nia. He seems to feel more secure when he's with her. The team look on anxiously as the pair start to explore the fence line. With so little known about the species, no one's quite sure how far they can leap and jump. They may be small, but they're fast and very bouncy. For now, they seem happy to explore. The next concern is whether they'll want to come back in. But Emily does have a plan in place. So for the first day, as it's the first time going outside, we're um, not going to put any food out there initially for them. We're going to keep all the nice, tasty treats inside for them because what we really want them to do is come outside, explore their new surroundings, but still be happy to come and go from the house. Obviously, we don't want anybody going outside and just feeling like they have to camp out there. So by keeping all the nice stuff inside, when they do come back in, we can reward them by saying well done for finding the route back in and also coming back in. The final member of the odd group to venture outdoors is geriatric ring-tailed lemur George. He may be slow, but he's also keen to explore, 
and has the comfort of knowing that his devoted companion Mitsa will always be watching his back. For the team, the whole exercise is one big learning curve. So little is known about this species, the white-throated guenon out of Benin, and this is a particular subspecies, so there are two different types of white-throated guenon. We have red-bellied, so as they get healthier, we'll start seeing a little bit more of that red belly russet tones coming through. I've actually sent some DNA samples off to confirm what species I believe they are. And I'm hoping that the geneticists will also be able to tell me whether they're full brother and sister or half brother and sister. So that will be interesting to know if they were sort of captured at the same time and from the same group and therefore share potentially the same father. Um, and, you know, now we just have to take a cue from them because so little is known about them. It's now up to us to watch them and see what their needs are. As they grow, they're gonna get almost double in size in the coming weeks and months. Um, and we'll have to look to them to see whether they want more high level platforms, whether they want more walkways, ropes, what it is that would make their life better. So this isn't it for Benny and Nia. This is a really good first chapter in their new life but one that we're gonna to have to be developing as they get fitter, healthier, and grow to full size. The day's been a real success. All four of this unique group have made it outside, and it's all been harmonious. To cap it off, just like she would have done in the wild, Nia ventures right up into the trees. After all they've been through, it's lovely to see this pair so relaxed in their new enclosure. The absolute welfare of all the primates at the park is the priority for everyone. It's one of the many reasons Jim, with the help of Jeremy, started the center more than 30 years ago. Throughout this period, many difficult decisions have had to be made, and today looks likely to be one of those days. The team, including wildlife vet John Lewis, regularly come together to discuss various concerns and issues, which have come to the attention of the primate care staff with the aim of finding the best solution possible. And at today's meeting, their big cause for concern is much-loved capuchin monkey, Tao. Yeah, I'd like to fix Tao, but I accept that we're not going to be able to reverse anything ever, and it's getting to the point where he does look ropey. Tao has been really struggling recently. The team are worried that, despite being on painkillers and other medication to help his mobility, He's still suffering. What are we waiting for? This isn't going to get better. We're only waiting for some form of catastrophe at this point in time. I'm very dubious that you can provide <clears throat> even analgesia. And that, to me, is pretty serious. OK. Totally. Earlier today, John took a good look at Tao within the confines of his bedroom. His main issue is really yeah, now in so his hips. If we see any weakness, then that's where it's going to be. He has had the odd fall where he tries to move too quickly, or unfortunately the females sometimes do target him. From what he saw and heard firsthand from the keepers, there's very little option. Should we just call it a day and have John and Jeremy help them today? If we're going to make a decision to do that, to euthanize them, we'll do it today. It's an awful decision to have to make, but sadly, it's been coming for a while and stems back to his previous life as a pet trade monkey. Tao arrived at the park in 2011 when he was rescued from Slovenia. He was kept as a family pet in the basement of the house and, although the owners meant well, they didn't have the expertise or knowledge of how to care for a capuchin. He didn't have the correct diet, exercise, or enough sunlight to develop properly. Tao was just six years old when he arrived and in a terrible condition. He had an extremely curved and fused spine, he was skinny and had very little muscle tone, all caused by being kept as a pet in an inappropriate environment. He had really profound rickets or bone disease, so he was hunched over, his mobility was really poor, and quite frankly, when we rescued him, I remember the day I got a phone call from Jeremy, who was coming back with him saying, I don't know if he's gonna make it. 
So yeah, he was probably one of the um, worst shaped capuchin monkeys that we've ever brought into the park in, in 30 years. But despite this, incredibly, Tao thrived at the park. Not only did he recover, he turned into a ripped, gorgeous male, albeit handicapped, and became the leader of a very large group of ladies who all adored him. So in the end, Tao went from zero to like Adonis in a very short period of time and became the leader of a really lovely group of ladies. He overcame physical problems and learned to integrate and become a brilliant leader, loved by all the Capuchins and staff. But over the last year, despite moving to a much smaller group and enclosure, his mobility has gone downhill. It was a sign to us that his condition was developing and worsening, um, and our greatest concern was how much pain he might be in because his spine's so deformed that, you know, it, it was probably going to have an impact upon his longevity and his life. Before they make a final decision, the team talk to primate care worker Donna, who heads up the Capuchin team. From a personal point of view, I know he's not going to get any better, and I don't want to leave it too late. I think everybody knows that it's coming. I don't think it'll be a shock that it's happening, just that it's happening. It might be happening today. I don't think so. Sorry, I don't have a magic answer for him. Yeah. All right, I'll talk to everyone, and then I'll let you know. Thank you. Cool. Once Donna has informed the rest of the team of the decision, John heads over to Tao's bedroom. At just 13 years of age, he's actually younger than most of the Capuchins at the park and should be entering the prime of his life. It's a really rough and terrible thing, and it makes me feel... <sighs> makes me both upset and angry. It's time to call it a day and to help Tao, and it's the final thing that we can do for him. But it's not right. Next time on Monkey Life, Alison collects a new squirrel monkey, ousted from her troop and needing a new home. So hopefully he'll just be a quick grab and into the box and that'll all be done. Sounds like it's happening right now. And a termite mound challenge for the chimps as they work hard for their breakfast.